Calling Dick Tracy. Calling Dick Tracy. <laughs> come in, Tracy. Come in. <laughs> you better get down here fast. I think something's about to happen. We got to find out if they're together. Dick. That's an interesting name. My bottom hurts just thinking about it. It's a shame she doesn't say that actually in the movie. I know, right? Mm-hmm. Doesn't isn't that just that never like, that would have gotten cut. There's no oh, way it would have Disney slash touchtone would have been like <laughs> Especially if she'd have said it at that point when she's doing her little cat table pose on the on the mm-hmm. desk. And I'm it just like sun- it must be Sunday somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> What's your day off? <laughs> Oh, the one-liner. It's just fantastic. Thanks for calling. I was beginning to wonder what a girl had to do to get arrested. Wearing that dress is a step in the right direction. Are you going to make a move? Do I have to do everything? I'm on duty. What's your day off? Sunday. It's a big world. Must be Sunday somewhere. Excuse me, but I'm singing in one key and you're singing in another. Poor is the man whose pleasures depend on the permission of a woman. Open the door now and suffocate. Just just give me a fan. I don't trust any man who hasn't kissed another man. I'm waiting. All right, people, it's time to get your dancing shoes on. You're listening to MLBC. It's all Madonna, all the time. Welcome to the party, bitches. You're up, Ben. All right. Hold on. Let me go back to the show notes. I've had like a bottle of wine and oh, several gins Oh, it's that type today. of night. It's that oh, type it's of a, night. It's been a Sunday fun day and a half, kids. Mm-hmm. All right. Here we go. <laughs> well, well, well. You better get down here because it's Ben. Hey, everybody. It's Liberty. You sound very breathless, Liberty. You don't know whether you want to hit me or kiss me. I get that. I better find out if they're together. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, everybody, it's Stefan. Welcome to another edition of MLVC, the Madonna podcast, your place for all things Madonna Louise, Veronica Ciccone. It's the return of our much beloved Madonna summer movie series. <laughs> Last summer, we reviewed three Madonna movies, Desperately Seeking Susan, Shanghai Surprise, and Who's That Girl? And this summer, we are going to go through another three in the Madonna catalog. We are starting with Dick Dick Tracy, A League of Their Own, and ending with Body of Evidence. It's going to be a jam-packed summer. Are you you kids ready? We're ready. Yeah. I mean, I'm all the way May. I'm ready to, uh, you know, maybe, maybe... (laughs) Maybe a titty's going to come flying out. Who knows? You're wearing black underwear, I'm Ben. Mine. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ben's oh, wearing his black underwear. And we, I'm, we have I've to say for the... I've got my hot candle wax. <laughs> <laughs> and just just for the Broadway kids out there, maybe one day we'll get to Bloodhounds of Broadway. I'm just saying. Oh, that will be a deep dive. I maybe. don't think I've ever seen that. Mm. Oh, you should watch it. Her duet with Jennifer Grey is gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do mm. need to watch that. It's all about yeah. that. You're going to want bangs after you watch that yes, movie. Yes, yes. <laughs> I've already <laughs> been thinking about that. My goodness. Oh. <laughs> well, let's see. We're going to talk today about Dick Tracy. So let's center ourselves for a moment back into the 1990 hot, hot summer. I don't know how old you folks were, but I was about... Old enough. 13. Um, American action crime film based in... On the 1930s comic strip character of the same name, Dick Tracy. I'm going to say Dick as many times as I can. Shocking. (laughs) Warren Beatty produced, directed, and starred in the film with an amazing star-studded supporting cast, including, obviously, our girl Madonna, but also Al Pacino, Glenn Headley, with appearances by Dustin Hoffman, Mandy Patinkin, Catherine O'Hara, James Caan, And Dick Van Dyke. Mm, We have to get into the supporting cast a lot more later. So for those of you who don't know, Dick Tracy was in development for many years, as far back as the early 80s. And some big names were attached to it. Of course, Steven Spielberg, the king of 80s movies, John Landis, Walter Hill, and Richard Benjamin, who the kids may not know, amazing in the 80s. And eventually the film came to Warren Beatty, and the movie was filmed 
on the Universal Studios lot. The score was composed by Danny Elfman, who had just come off of Beetlejuice and Batman. Yep. And Broadway legend, R.I.P. Stephen Sondheim was recruited to write songs for Madonna's character, Breathless Mahoney. Now, I think, and I'm not 100% sure about this, but that Dick Tracy, I'm sorry, that Warren Beatty still owns the rights to Dick Tracy. Correct. That is correct. All right. Uh, I just was... For that sequel that's still forthcoming. Yeah. Or the Broadway musical that won't happen until he passes on into the ether anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dick Dick, Tracy 2. Yeah. uh, uh, Dick Tracy 2. The what is it the uh, the old folks home or <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's gonna be doing some crazy stunts all around the uh, the uh, rec room all right so Dick Tracy premiered on June tenth nineteen ninety and was released a nationwide a day later reviews ranged from favorable to mixed with positive comments on Madonna's acting and Beatty's direction. The film was a success at the box office and at awards time. It garnered seven Academy Award nominations, winning in three of the categories Best Original Song, Best Makeup, and Best Art Direction. Dick Tracy is remembered today for its incredible visual style. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's get right to it. Let's talk about Madonna in this movie. She is a supporting character. She's not the star, the lead, which is a very change of pace for her coming off of Shanghai Surprise and Who's That Girl. Breathless Mahoney is a force to be reckoned with in this film. I I mean, she basically steals focus from anyone else when she's on camera in a frame with somebody else. Side note, Madonna, who was dating Dick Tracy star and director Warren Beatty at the time, wanted the role of Breathless so badly, she agreed to work for scale to avoid the perception of nepotism from boyfriend Warren Beatty. And she just got paid a measly $35,000 to be in the film. I I was always shocked by that stat. I think it worked out for her. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, good for her. Uh, But let's, let's talk about Madonna's performance in this movie. So she was obviously panned for Shanghai Surprise and Who's That Girl? And... Going into Dick Tracy, I, you know, I had high hopes for this movie and for her. Um, I loved her in this movie. I, I think she's a wonderful, wonderful actress in this movie. What do you think? I can agree. I think that the partnership between her and Warren helped to sort of elevate her style as mm-hmm. an actor. And I think uh, she she's always been um, rumored to have excellent um ability to take direction when on set that she's extremely professional as an actor. So I think it shows through. And I think that, you know, Warren knew what he wanted out of her and he pushed hard to get it. And she did a great job. I think. Yeah. Ben, uh, I would agree. It, it was the first time since desperately seeking Susan and the briefly aforementioned bloodhounds of Broadway that she was only in briefly where she was natural seeming and she didn't come across as stiff on camera, like a deer caught in headlights, like her eye and her gaze and her facial expressions seem natural and Mm -hmm. fit the character. I mean, let's be honest. She had some of the best one liners and yet also the campiest lines in the film. She delivered all of them as was required for the role. She looked amazing. She understood how to physically embody the character, which I, which was interesting because, you know, we all know that she speaks best with her body as a Mm -hmm. trained dancer. And when paired with music, that's her place. But like, she understood how someone like breathless would carry themselves through the world. Right. Like, the posture, the way she got in and out of vehicles a few times in the movie Mm -hmm. and just how she would cross a room. She also was like so crazy thin. I was watching like a lot of behind the siege footage. Apparently they rehearsed the Moore scene for like three days, almost nonstop. And there's footage of it from an old like German a television show interview from the set where Madonna's Mm -hmm. just like smoking cigarettes nonstop. (laughs) But like, it's funny to watch her rehearsing it as Madonna with her hair and a headband and like a cute black dress. But then once, then when you see it again in the movie and she's doing it in character, like the posture and the body language and the sort of lack of Madonna esque precision is there. And I was like, Oh, okay. Like, 
you you did the homework. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely yeah, was I, on top of the game. I remember when she said mm-hmm. about the rehearsing, she had to, you know, Warren told her that she had to do the numbers poorly because you know big boy was slapping her around and didn't want her you know she's tired and exhausted and she was not used to just phoning it in you know she was as madonna the singer she's used to putting on great shows and always giving her all and she had to like dial that back and she thought it was very strange to do something not 100 percent. and but i thought it came through i thought it worked really well i mean her per her characterization of Breathless, I thought was so on point. I, I, I felt like you understood the character. You understood her pain and her yearning and you really got it. You know, like she's this woman who is basically just trying to stay alive and she's yeah. latching herself to these mob guys because she knows if she doesn't, she's going to die. And mm-hmm. so she's just like accepting the abuse and she sees Dick Tracy and she's like, oh, my God, this is my way out. Uh, you know, like because he he's the first person who sort of sees her as a person. You right. know, he he recognizes her as a person and treats her with respect, which the other men in the movie aren't doing. And I think that's why she sort of gravitates to him as a character. And I think Madonna's acting is totally underrated for in that movie i don't know if people appreciate her as much as i feel like they should oh i think agree yeah, yeah I, I think so and I, I think it's because a lot of people have trouble separating madonna the star from madonna in a film as a different character and so you yeah. always think uh and it is even hard for me as a as a fan obviously I struggle with that, like where I'm thinking about the story, thinking about the character as I'm watching, but I'm also thinking like, that's Madonna, that's Madonna, that's Madonna. And I have a lot of trouble sort of taking and and categorizing one or the other or letting go of that too. Mm -hmm. Um, But one question I actually have for you, because I, uh, and and I'm thinking maybe Ben, you may have a good answer here just uh, with your knowledge of possibly comics. Have either of you read the comic of Dick Tracy? Uh, I, I, I've, yes. I mean, not just what was used to be in like the Sundays, the Mm, inserts in the papers, but I've read some of the collected works. Um, I just I'm didn't sh- know if she if she's a character in that as well. If Breathless she is. is also- okay. She Breathless, is. Breathless, yeah. actually, because I read in this, I have this making of the movie, this Dick Tracy book that I had found, or I guess I bought it or somebody gave it to me. I'm not quite sure where I got it, but it does talk a little bit about Dick Tracy, the cartoon, uh, the comic strip. And apparently Breathless was not introduced until 1945, oh. but um, they sort of retrofitted her because they wanted that character in the movie. So breathless isn't introduced until later in the comic strip, but they, they put her in the 1930s with Dick Tracy for this, for this film. Okay. Yeah. So, she was, she, cause the original comic strip character was Jean Harlow inspired, right? Forties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. They I also mean, definitely, they definitely <laughs> improved on breathless's style because the, uh, the, the, ver- the version in the comic strip, she's a little frumpy. <laughs> Yeah. Well, not only that, I mean, frankly, the best acting job in the entire movie is Madonna's hair. Like, <laughs> like, I mean, snaps, claps, like oh my God, it's every so good. different version of that curly bouffant that appears in that movie. And last night when I was rewatching it, I counted 11 different versions. Yep. Mm. Uh, I mean, my favorite. Uh, my favorite is probably the sooner or later one when she's in the sparkly black dress. Not the the first appearance of the song, but the second one. Mm-hmm. That's sort of upswept. Oh, my Lord. Heaven, Jesus. Uh, Just, there's quite a few of, like, her hairstyle and her outfits. Like, so many of... And, well, let's let's talk about that a little bit, too. It's That's part of Breathless. Breathless's character, I mean, she's dressed to the nines. You never see that girl in a pair of jeans. She is wearing a ball gown everywhere she goes. Mm-hmm. You know, she's like, regardless if it's to the club for rehearsal or going to the dock late at night yeah. to meet up with Dick Tracy. <laughs> she's like wearing a fur with a full-length ball gown, driving that purple car around mm-hmm. town. And I'm like, well, God bless her for... 
for putting that much effort in. You're going going for a stroll to Dick Tracy's in the middle of the afternoon with a backless crisscross dress. I mean, <laughs> it's 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 flawless. Yeah, it's gorgeous, and I think that hairstyle. I mean, uh, uh, the the curly ringlet blonde that is. For me, when I think of Madonna, that's like the image that I have. I, I think because it carried through in the Blonde Ambition tour yes. um, when she got to, Ex- to Well, it started with Europe. the Express Yourself, basically. Yeah. You know, like the, the Express Yourself Bob is basically Breathless Mahoney. And that is my absolute favorite hairstyle on her and in general. <laughs> but if I could do that and have that forever. But my hair is not naturally curly, so it would take hours hours i yeah, tell you it's from the black panties up it was flawless mm-hmm. flawless mm-hmm. mahoney absolutely yeah and i mean some of the lines like you said ben i mean it it is so wonderfully quotable some of her lines like i love when they arrest big boy at the very first time and mm-hmm. You too, breathless. And as they're pulling her out, you don't even see her when she's saying this, but you can hear her in the back. She goes, "I wasn't gambling; I was singing." Mm-hmm. And uh, like it's just this <laughs> off little, this little line. I love how she says it because you hear then you hear Big Boy say, "This this isn't the cops," and you hear her say, "Who are they?" And she's so like. It's her voice that she's doing in that scene is so like 1930s. The, you know how the, in the 1930s they always spoke. Well, what are you talking about here? I yeah. don't even understand what you mean. You know, like, let's, let's go over there, shall we? And and Madonna is like, I, I wasn't gambling. I was singing. Who are yeah. they? You know, like it's it's so fun how she how she does that. Yeah, I think that that's you know a nod to her being so well versed in. In the history of film, I think she watch, has watched so many yeah. amazing films and she knew about these great actors of the 30s and, and had was channeling as mm-hmm. she played. Breathless. Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't – they weren't arresting Big Boy. They were arresting Lips Manless. Lips, And he yeah. was sitting <laughs> – because she has that wonderful introduction where she's singing sort of almost acoustic version of Sooner or Later in that I mean, skin, she's whispering it. Like she's not even singing it. Skin-tight dress. I mean, it's – She's so gorgeous in that skin tight dress. And I love how the camera just pans in on her as, and it, as she's finishing that line, it's that look under her eye, that quintessential Madonna, half the hair is covering mm-hmm. her face. And it's like her face, the, the, the hair eyebrows. is almost shaking because yeah. she's got so much emotion going on. And I love that whole interaction where she just sits opposite of lips while he's slurping on those oysters. And it's just disgusting. The sound Yuck. guys did such oh a God. wonderful job at making that mm-hmm. sound so disgusting. And do you mind if I, do you mind if I leave? Why? Cause I get sick when you eat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you didn't used to, well, you didn't used to be a Zeppelin and uh, she's just so Good at delivering her lines. I love it. I can't get enough. Yes. It's yeah. interesting you mentioned the framing because that was another thing I noticed in my my last rewatch was Beatty's choices with framing, especially her face, but he does mm-hmm. it with Glenn Headley and some of the other actors. And, of course, I was sitting there. I was like, well, Warren was friends with Herb Ritz, and mm-hmm. he had this whole technique about how he framed faces and how they were lit. And there's all these like sl- like slats of light in the like half lighting the faces yes. of so many characters through this movie. And I'm like, I think they were all hanging out at Madonna's house talking about this because <laughs> it's just too coinc- it's too obvious to be coincidental that there wasn't some influence there because Beatty hadn't directed a movie since Ishtar. Before that, so it had been a while since he'd been behind the camera and done yeah. anything, and he definitely was upping his visual technique game with this with this film. So, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So it's a good segue. Let's talk about the the aesthetic look of the film. I mean, mm-hmm. it's oh, absolutely rich. stunningly beautiful to watch. Yeah. I, I rewatched it Friday. I mean, I've seen this movie so many times. I think I saw it three times in the theater alone. You know, mm-hmm. um, and then owned it on vhs and dvd and i think i rented it on youtube so i could watch it because i don't have a dvd player to watch it anymore and i it was just from the moment it starts to the moment it ends it is like a cartoon come to life in a really good way and i had done some reading about how you know to set the scene the 1990s this was before you know digital animation 
came on the scene. Did all of the the shots that you see of the cityscape and some of like the bigger, l- wider shots of the city in general are all matte paintings. That was, mm-hmm. you know, artists painting on on mats and then inserting the film. It's all like it's all real. It's they really it's practical um practical special effects, which is fantastic to think about that they, you know, that at the very end scene when you're seeing the sunset and the subway is racing across the the Mm -hmm. skyline at the very end and the sun is peeking through the subway. That's all done practically. Like they, they, they're really, you know, like, I mean, again, it's not a real subway car, but it's, it's not digital animation, which is, so it's trippy, but love the colors. I mean, the colors are, it is like a Pantone wet dream in that movie where just like, the yellows and the reds and the, like everything is just so vibrant and wonderful, which I then also love the comparison of all of the characters of Dick Tracy and then breathless Mahoney because mm-hmm. breathless is basically dressed for a funeral the entire time. Like yeah. you, I think she only wears like a blue, I think in that one scene and you don't even see her. I was so pissed it's off. It's just her hip and her hands yeah. and her bare belly through the, through the, Lace. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I, I mean, like, I just love that they sort of like her, her color palette is so dark compared yeah. to everyone else. I mean, the, everyone else is like living this fantastic, colorful existence and <laughs> Breathless is not. Yeah, that kind of is, I wonder about that a little bit because given that, I mean, there's no indication I didn't read the comic. So I don't know if there's any sort of detail about how uh, these particular characters get their names, for example, um, you know, li- like lips or mumbles or, you know, they don't sort of allude to the stories behind, you know, the reason why, um, little face has such a little face, but a big head or any, and, and not that there's room for any of that in the film, but, but breathless is such a standout because she's so, she's highly stylized, right. As a character. I mean, if you saw a person like that in real life, you'd be like, wow, you know, you wouldn't even <laughs> yeah. think that, that was a real person, but, um, but we don't know why. She, why is she breathless? Is, the, is it the singing, right? Is it the why? She, why is know. that her name? I don't think that it's it's meant to be like. I think because the comic strip is so old, this was before they had like origin stories. So I don't mm-hmm. think you're actually supposed to think that. Like it's like mumbles is mumbles because he mumbles. You know, right? I'm just thinking like, uh, given that we don't have all of that history, you know, and and then also thinking about the timing of how Batman. Uh, was that after? Before. That was the year, summer that before. That was the year before. Before, okay. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of those films at the time were sort of having these extreme characters, but true to true to the comic book specifically. Well, I, um, most of the mob characters were true to their visual representations in the comic, and their names were just really driven by their visual representation. But as Stefan mm-hmm. mentioned earlier, Breathless came later and is probably the character, other than I would say Mumbles, that's the most changed from like what they looked like or did in the comic strip into the film. Like I'm right. sort of hanging a lot on that just because yeah. Warren really wanted this to be close to the comic as close yes. as possible, um, as true as possible uh, to what the original comic was. And I guess that's why I'm thinking mm. about that in relationship you, to the color and the, sim- the color scheme. So, but consider mm-hmm. the fact that Breathless is the only character who wears all black. I mean, we're talking about the color story. There is a there is a color reason in the right. wardrobing why she's in all black. Correct. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's talk about the rest of the cast because it is a star studded cast that joins Madonna and Warren Beatty. As Liberty mentioned, Al Pacino, Manny Patinkin. Uh, we had the kid played by Charlie Corsmo. We mm-hmm. also have, I mean, Dick Van Dyke. I didn't know Kathy Bates. Kathy plays Bates. The graph. The, I was like, what? <laughs> I've seen the movie so many times. I never knew it was her doing yeah. that. Um, I, I mean, I didn't even know Catherine O'Hara was in that movie. They totally, I know, I totally she forgot that. Totally um, yeah. her. Like, yeah. That's, that's such a waste of a character. Mm-hmm. She's such a wonderful actress. But um, yeah, I just, I love how they do, all of those people are doing such a great 
job at selling those characters. Even like all of the people under their makeup, like you can't even know who they are because their yeah. their makeup is just so like amazing and like so wonderfully done that you can't see the performer behind the makeup, but they, they sell the characters and they're like, it's, it's a James Caan. He's in the movie. I mean, there's mm-hmm. so many fantastic actors who, what's one of your favorite, like other than Madonna or, uh, Dick Tracy himself. What, what's one of your favorite characters in the movie? Do you have one, Ben? Oh, I mean, Oh, I'm not going to lie. I really, really enjoy Dustin Hoffman as Mumbles. It's so ridiculous. And the scene at the end when they're playing back his recordings and they reveal that everything he mumbles is actually, it's like he's talking at like two times regular yeah. speed. Like when you listen yeah. to Spotify podcasts on like the high speed, <laughs> it's like literally mumbles is like a Spotify podcast for the truth played at two times the speed and that, but then they slow it down and he's like, big boy did it. I I love that. I thought that was brilliant. 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 Liberty. How about you? Do you have a favorite character other than breathless? (sighs) Um, I mean, it's hard to choose because, but I, of course I love Al Pacino always. And I love, uh, the job he does in this, but 88 keys. Come oh, on. Yes. Mandy yes. Patinkin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A victim of the cutting room floor. Cause yeah. I know. If you, if you watch, there was some MTV Europe interview where Madonna does, and she tells this whole backstory between 88 keys and breathless Mahoney. And Cause, and she's clearly recording the interview on set while they're filming in like March of 89, even before like a prayer had come out and then you're like, you watch the movie and you're like, none of this is in the movie. And you're like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, because that's the 45 to 90 minutes that's on the cutting room yeah. floor. So, yep. Yep. Oh, yeah, I know. That their, was a, their whole subplot. I'm like, where is that movie? That was a stupid thing to do. He's the best piano player in town. <laughs> I love when they like slam, <laughs> yeah. they slam the piano on his hands. And then Big Boy, come here. And then he slaps Breathless. And he's like... He sounds pretty good. He's playing pretty good right now or something like that. Yeah. You know, like, so it's good. it's difficult to choose just because there's the everyone does such an amazing job being the character that they are. Yeah. And um you know the only the only tragic not tragedy but just a sad a little bit of a sad bit is that you know you don't get more because each character really you could just find a whole, you know, just like they've done with Batman the Riddler, etc. Um, the Joker, excuse me, where you get a little bit, a whole movie just around that character and really mm-hmm. feel that it's, it's could have been amazing to have more out of that. I, so I uh, personally, my thought, I thought about this too, Liberty, the fact that Beatty runs through almost the entire rogues gallery of Dick Tracy, whereas the Batman movies tended, they started with one and then they were doing two in each movie. Beatty yeah. did not. He watched Batman, and when it came, they had already filmed Dick Tracy, and then Batman came out, and you know Warren Beatty went in that editing room and was like, "I am not getting overshadowed by the villain." Yeah, let's cut this movie so me and Miss Thing <laughs> are the stars. I am not getting overshadowed by all these other people. One hundred percent. I mean, look, I, I, as much as I love Madonna, and I do love Al Pacino in the movie. I mean, he's fantastic. I mean, I thought the kid was great. Um, but I love like Glenn Headley in that movie. Uh, I know. Uh, all right. she's she's so good. It's, it's, but she's so wonderful in mm-hmm. that movie. Just her scenes where like the, the, I love the scene with the kid where she has, she's sitting alone at the table and the kids taking the money that Dick Tracy put down because he has to run out and try and yeah. get a big boy or something. And she, without a beat, she just turns from saying goodbye to Dick Tracy. She turns around and she just goes back to eating her banana split. And she's like, do you want a fat lip or something like that? And, or do you want a broken arm? arm? Yeah. And, he just puts the money back on and she, she does something with her eye. Like she does a little eyebrow thing or something. Just, it's such subtle little nuances that she has Mm -hmm. with him and just the conversations that she has with Dick Tracy. Uh, I mean, obviously I love the scene 
when she walks in with the ice cream and she spots breathless kissing Dick Tracy and the pain that she has when she goes and sits in the kitchen, like in the kitchen, she keeps a stiff upper, a stiff upper, stiff upper lip until breathless leaves, which again, Miss True Heart, what a cute little boy. And I love, <laughs> I love how what she so says dismissive. that. She oh says, my God. Like she wraps her voice around what a cute little boy. And it's like, there's this little, listen to it. It's so, it's so brilliant. And then she just like trounces out and well, now that's a dame. And then poor Glenn Headley, like Tess just goes and just crumbles in the yeah. kitchen. And it's, yeah. it's so, it's so beautiful. And her I performance mean, you, is wonderful. You can feel for her because of, mm-hmm because of what Tracy has does in their relationship. It's like, why does oh, yeah. I just he's, stick I mean, around? Oh, he's yeah. the worst boyfriend ever. Yeah. Speaking and I mean, Al- Oh, go on. Sorry. I was just going to say really for, even for breathless that, you know, she's, she's sort of being abused all the time. And so that's yeah. what I was about to talk about because Stefan okay. just mentioned <laughs> enjoying Al Pacino in the movie. I hated Big boy, and I wanted Al Pacino and his character to die a violent death that we do not get to see because he makes Madonna cry like three times and physically assaults her three times. I'm like, I'm yeah. not into this. I no one, especially after the whole divorce and Sean Penn until death do us part and all that stuff. This is the one point in the movie where, like Liberty, I could not separate the icon from the role mm-hmm. because I was like, do not hit her. Like yeah. we, we are not here for that. this. Do what? It was rough watching that. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, because oh, I was like, how dare he hit her? Yeah. I was like, oh, wait, she's playing a character. But then when that little tear comes out of her eye after he slaps her, after he smashes 88 keys, his fingers, and she stands up for 88 keys, which is our first sign that there's like something more there. And then he slaps her. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. oh, oh, he just hit her. I want him to die. <laughs> well, like- to go back and think about the way the world was in 1990 when the movie comes out and who, how, what we accepted on television, what we accepted as far as in movies oh, and yeah. films and, and stories is, uh, it was, a, it was a lot different then. And as you know, I mean, because the movie was sort of aimed at kids, right? I mean, I'm a, I was a very impressionable 13 year old girl watching that. And I don't remember having any feelings at the time about don't hit, you know, I, I not because <laughs> I think about, uh, but now it is such a part of the fabric of our sort of society, as far as the awareness of, of mistreatment and abuse of, of women or of anyone Absolutely. specifically. Yeah. In the uh, the making of the movie book that I have, they have this wonderful interview with Madonna and they do ask her, describe the relationship between Breathless and Big Boy. And Madonna says, I had nothing but contempt for Big Boy and he would treat me like a bad little girl. He was always slapping me and spanking me. And in terms of being on set, whenever Al Pacino would put his prosthetics on and his suit, he was a gross pig. And he's not that way in real life. He's very gracious and well-mannered and gentlemanly and sweet. As big boy, he would tell me the dirtiest jokes and suck on his cigar like he, it was some sort of weird phallic symbol and just be a pig. He was always smacking my butt and my face. I hated him. I loathed him. I was disgusted by him. And so what happened off camera was that I'd always try to be moving away from him. And he'd always grab me and go, get over here, which is exactly what happened in the movie. Every time I expressed my distaste for him, he would smack me, which is also what happened in the movie. I got mad. He made me cry sometimes. There was a scene where he kept smacking me in the stomach and it would sting. And what made me cry was not so much the hit, but the fact that Warren wouldn't stop. He would just keep going and I was humiliated. So it worked because that's what happened to Breathless. She was totally humiliated by Big Boy. Wow. Process. And people, I was going to say, people, you know, like to give her uh, crap about her acting ability. But honestly, she really worked hard. I couldn't do that. Well, I, I think just, I would well, have to like say what something. you were saying about like it's such a different time. Like, yeah, that would never be allowed today. No one would ever be allowed to like if it wasn't part of the scene. There is no way in hell an actor would be allowed to slap Madonna off camera. <laughs> just you to, could even because, look at her. Yeah. Well, let's be honest. I'm still surprised that he was permitted. I mean, yes, he was Al Pacino even then, but like. Yeah, I, I 
that it also speaks to how badly she wanted to be part of Hollywood and oh, be yes. part of that sort of classic, you know, sort of the Liz Taylor of it all, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. Like the guts for the glory of it all. Mm-hmm. And yeah, hopefully she she would speak differently on that today. And I think she would, given her own sort of journey through these issues. Well, and it's I, interesting that, you know, I mean, we're jumping ahead probably to another summer movie series edition, but, um, you know, when she was in swept away, the same type of thing happened. Yeah. You know, she was, it was a very eerily similar character that, you know, she was another woman being, you know, physically assaulted by a man, you know, while yeah, her is husband is directing. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, well, it's, it's, it's a we, strange parallel, but we don't well, we don't need to we don't need to psychoanalyze. Yeah, we could get into a whole thing about the archetype of the powerful woman being uh, constantly being taken right. down by men, you know, there's yes. uh, yeah, there's thousands of pa- <laughs> millions of pages of critical thinking about this topic. So, anyway, mm. her hair so, <laughs> our hands like Let's butter. Let's go back to like, yeah. like a big <laughs> stick of butter. <laughs> Hello. You're breaking and entering, you know. Sorry. Sit down. Are you gonna arrest me? I'm gonna arrest you. I'd have done it by now. And what are you up to, honey? I think Lips Manless is dead. And I want you to tell me who killed him. Or maybe you weren't on his side. Whose side are you on? The side I'm always on. Mine. No grief for lips? I'm wearing black underwear. You know, it's legal for me to take you down to the station and sweat it out of you under the lights. I sweat a lot better in the dark. I know how you feel. You don't know if you want to hit me or kiss me. I get a lot of that. Look, you're safe. Big boy's in jail. You're the one that can keep him there. Give me a call. Yeah, it was. Uh. It was just. It's just gorgeous to see her um, at that time to rewatch now and and just to look at how she's physically changed, but is still a beautiful. I mean, at that time, beautiful. And and it's interesting, too, because up till then, I mean, I know that around sort of True Blue, she's starting to look a little bit more or she's doing a little bit more of this 40s sort of glam look about her. I mean, I know it appeared in Material Girl, right? But when she gets in that, um, you know, physical space where she looks so classic, it's so gorgeous. Mm-hmm. It's just so breathtaking how she it, it makes you breathless <laughs> to yeah. look at her in that uh because she her face is just so i guess romanesque it's got this you know she's not a perfect face but it somehow it is symmetrical looks perfect well, well i mean look, we, all, we all look we all look flawless and and beautiful at 31 right Mm. Right. Well, but it was it was to what Liberty was talking about. It was that it was it was drawing on all these classical archetypes of the 30s and 40s, but yet was still decidedly modern in terms of I mean, she still had the big old Italian 80s eyebrows. Right. Like they were really popping in that movie, like watching it on like a big screen TV in high debt and, you know, HDR. You're like, oh, look at them caterpillars. (laughs) And, you know, but they were still doing the thing and like the cherubic cheeks. And she clearly had had like the slide slightly plumped lips that she sported for that entire year. Right. So. She didn't go full thirties on it, which I thought was fine. Yeah. yeah. Not, mm-hmm. I mean, but neither did, you know, Glenn Headley wasn't full thirties oh, either. I mean, no. The, the styling was very sort of thirties inspired, you know, some of it was right. a bit yes. more buttoned up than others, but, um, you know, well, and, you know, speaking of, you know, things that I, we would notice, you know, in huge detail, that scene when Dick Tracy goes into her dressing room and you're breaking and entering, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and then she's wearing black underwear. I had no idea that she was topless in that yeah. scene. And I was rewatching it for, literally 30 years later. I've learned, still learned something new about Madonna stuff that I've 
watched over and over and over again. I had never noticed that you could clearly see her tits in this. Yeah. In this yeah. Outfit. And there they are, breasts aplenty. It was like the Vogue outfit. Where yeah, I was like, just oh, weeks what? after, yeah, weeks after all the controversy of the nipple exposure in the Vogue video, she's I mean, out so here in a there? Disney movie. Was that in that movie the whole time? And I've just yes. never watched it. Or had they, did yeah. they darken it when it first came out? And now they don't care about it because, like, that we, movie's PG. We probably just I mean, didn't notice it in the theaters. How? How did we not notice that? I, I, don't I mean, know. it's they're right there. But I, think about the first film. Thing I, saw. I was like, oh my god. Her, how did I okay, not see but her but this goes back to what I was just saying about the eyebrows. We're watching it on new technology, and oh, even I if the you. I mean, Dick Tracy has not been remastered for digital any way, shape, or form, but we're still viewing it in technology in a format where we are seeing. Like, it was very interesting, like, some of the close-ups, even when she was lit, sort of sort of just off the angle from straight ahead. Like, you could see all the lines and bags around her eyes oh. when she wasn't being shot with a soft, like, a filter over the light or soft lighting when they're in the office scene. It's the office she scene. Comes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And the frilly coat when she does the little kitty cat pose well, on top of the also, desk. I think yeah. there's also in that scene, there's a lot of overhead lighting. And I think, yes. I think yes. the overhead lighting is getting caught in her curls. Mm. So there's a lot of shadows happening on her eyes mm -hmm. because there are moments where you're like, oh, wait, why? She doesn't look as flawless here as it's that one part where like she goes, she, he drops the... He drops the, um, she tries to kiss him and he doesn't kiss her back. Puts the earring in the champagne. He drops the yes. earring in the champagne and that's when she realizes and she's like crying to him and she's like, you, you know, um, you, I'm just a cheap floozy, you know, and, and that scene where she's like sort of devastated. I mean, it works for her there. Why do you call me here? You know that car? What I'm looking for is a driver. Preferably one with some mileage. Yeah. I called you here because I want to know if you're ready to testify. You're right, Tracy. Why would you get mixed up with me? I'm a cheap floozy to you. I'll be lucky if I get through the week alive. They probably followed me here. It isn't easy, Tracy. You want to throw me in jail? Go ahead. But, um, yeah, oftentimes the, the shadows on her face sort of, I think it's because of the curls happening that sometimes yeah. she's not fully lit. No, it, it, yeah, it's interesting. What, and I, I was really struck by that too, is that I think it's the, with the technology that we're watching these things with now, you're like, oh, wait. Those are her breasts. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that. Because, you know, I'll be honest. I don't remember in the Vogue video. I'm like, you can see. When I remember seeing that on Entertainment Tonight, I was like, you can see her breasts in the Vogue video? I, now, of see, course, I think in the Vogue video, they blurred it so that they could play it on uh, MTV. I think they right. blurred it so that way you... Because I do remember seeing it, and then you don't see it again. But I think if you were to download the video off of iTunes, it's there. I wonder right. if it's there on but, YouTube. I wonder if I have to go see it now. It is. Cause, and then, but back in the day, I didn't have MTV. I had to watch all these videos on NBC's Friday Night Videos. Ooh, it was not blurred because that was on at 1 a.m. in the oh, morning. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when you would tape it, so I taped it, and I'm like, oh, yeah, there they are. Wow, mm -hmm. okay, sure. But, you know, I, I just don't – it's also interesting because – that was a big deal, but also wasn't a big deal. Like so right. much of this is like our framing with how we watch things now in this like heightened environment in which we are existing oh, yeah. today of cultural awareness about certain things. And I mean, I was also impressed with like her Greg Luganis black underwear in that outfit. I was like, girl, are you about to go on the high dive? Like, I can't tell if those are like a bad French bikini or like your Speedo. Like, what are those? That was a lot. I remember when they showed that scene on she, when she was on Arsenio Hall promoting the the film and the tour and the album, and they showed the clip because the movie hadn't come out yet, and that was like the first so time we got to see an actual clip of her in the movie. And they showed that and I just the audience was like freaking out as they were 
as you know, I'm wearing black underwear and they were all going crazy. <laughs> and, yeah. and I just, I remember loving that scene because of that clip yeah. that we got to see. It's the most Madonna line in the movie. Oh, totally. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's the one t- the one place where I was like, oh, no, that sounds like something she'd say <laughs> on David Letterman, right? <laughs> yeah. Four years later. But <laughs> it was it, but it was a great introduction to the character, you know, sort of out of the bigger canvas of mm-hmm. characters in the movie, for well, sure. Well, again, you know, you don't know if you want to hit me or kiss me. I get a lot of that. You know, like, it's all those, I mean, just line after line after line, she just gets some, some of the good ones. It's, mm-hmm. um, so let's, uh, you know, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Spoiler alert to all of our listeners. If you have not seen Dick Tracy and do not want to know how it ends, this is your warning. Pause this episode. Go watch Dick Tracy. Then come back and finish. Um, so I'm Na, 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 na. Here's your time to pause the episode. Blah blah blah. Okay. All right. So if the people who have do, who don't want to be spoiled, if you haven't turned off the show, too late. Be, you've been forewarned. So <laughs> let's talk about the ending. So unbeknownst to all of us, until the very end, mm-hmm. um, when breath. Uh, so th- there's a character in the movie called the blank, and. Mm-hmm. The blank is sort of doing dastardly things to Dick Tracy and framing him. And then he wants to kill Big Boy. And um, it's it's finally revealed after Big Boy shoots the blank. And then Dick Tracy knocks Big Boy over into the the, the abyss as that he falls down. That um, yeah, it was it was it was a bad death. For Unsatisfactory Big Boy. death. Yeah, he, he deserved he deserved something worse. He should have been squashed by that big gear or whatever yeah. <laughs> go yeah. on um and he, the, the the mask for the <sighs> blank is ripped off and there is revealed to be breathless mahoney yes. um now i have to say i knew going into the first screening of dick tracy that madonna was the blank and i will tell you why Did? so there were things that they were putting out to promote the movie some of which were Dick Tracy trading cards. And I was like oh. all about getting Dick Tracy swag because, uh, you know, because Madonna was in it. So I was like, I'm getting this making of the movie book. I'm getting a Dick Tracy t-shirt. I'm getting this. I'm getting that. I got Dick Tracy trading cards because I wanted a breathless Mahoney one. And in the Dick Tracy trading cards, which came out before the movie did, they have one with the blank. And mm. under it, they would like on, on the flip side of it, they would give a little description about the character and they spoil it on the trading card. They say who the blank is, the blank mm. other, you know, in disguise for, as breathless Mahoney or breathless Mahoney in disguise as the blank, however they worded it. And I was like, so I knew going into it, I was like, which I don't, I mean, I, there wasn't anything I could do, you know, like it had already been spoiled. And, <clears throat> but I remember <laughs> leaning over after the, one of the scenes of the blank, you know, like, yeah, you know, like, uh, 88 keys, you know, this and that. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I leaned over to my friend who was watching. I'm like, can you believe that's Madonna? And oh she, my gosh. She was like, what? <laughs> Cause I just assumed everybody else knew as well. Like I was like, Oh, oh everyone got spoiled because of course, uh, yeah, every, yeah, yeah. everyone's getting the trading cards just like me. And she's like, what? And she was like, Stefan, I can't believe you just spoiled the movie for me. I'm like, I thought you knew. <laughs> <laughs> I thought everybody knew. I thought everybody knew. Oh my gosh. So but. was it a, so, as someone who, did not have the the joy of being surprised. Was it a surprise for you? Did you have no idea? You go first, Liberty. I remember an audible gasp in the theater. That's all I can remember. I knew I must not have known in advance. Uh, although I can't imagine how I would have. I didn't go get trading cards. This was about around your birthday too, <laughs> Stephen. You probably got all this stuff for like for your birthday that year. I did. I, yeah, I, it was. Uh, I think I actually. I. I it was around my birthday that it came out. Right. Yeah, so I was like, it was a celebration. Yeah, ben, but were, I no, I don't remember. Ben, were you surprised? <sighs> I was not surprised because, as somebody who grew up on comic books and like had read some Dick Tracy, like it was so obvious because of the color stories that were being used in the movie. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I was so like, you were able to piece it together she's based the off bad of bad guy. Like it was, <laughs> she's the only character other than Dick Tracy who also wears a black suit. Yes. Mm -hmm. But he wears the yellow coat. 
she was the only character in black. I was like, mm-hmm. she has to be. And so then the minute that the blank got introduced, I was like, and then starts, of course, part of me wonders, is there some of that cutting room floor footage where 88 keys finds out that the blank is in fact breathless. And that's why he participates in the murder of the DA. Mm. Cause that whole scene does kind of come out of nowhere and you're like, what? Okay. 88 keys is delivering messages to big boy up to this point. And then all of a sudden he's murdering the DA. I'm like, (laughs) uh, this is what sitcom again. I'm like, so I feel like there's a point in there where probably like they're having some kind of of exchange and i mean maybe breathless like gave him a handy or something to get him to go along oh. with the scheme <laughs> but uh, to this me is the, it was a rated version of dick tracy <laughs> i mean you know if warren would ever get over himself and he would like put this out before he croaks but anyway um yeah i it was too obvious to me it, like there were all the foreshadowing and sort of the 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 color story and everything was like, Oh, she's the villain. And Mm -hmm. I was correct now. So after you know that Madonna is playing the blank and that is her playing the blank, like it's not just some other person doing it's her in that costume. If you go back and watch it, knowing that she's the blank, it's so fascinating to see like, Oh, the way she's moving, that's Madonna. Like when, Mm. when she runs up the stairs in the little motel, the, the way that she goes out the window, there's like, there are certain ways that she's moving that you cannot take away from Madonna. And it's mm-hmm. like, oh, that's Madonna in, in that costume. And it's fascinating to watch. Even if you listen to the voice, the voice is Madonna. It's just like slightly, like almost uh, not auto tuned, but like it's 88, like the way she's saying certain things. Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. yep, that's Madonna. It's just slightly disguised her voice. She climbs out of that hotel room like Nikki Finn. Yes, yes. yes. Just like when Nikki <laughs> climbed out the window, the blank climbs out the window. I was like, yeah. Like, which I noticed that last night. And I was like, oh, that's Nikki Flynn climbing out the window. So <laughs> That's interesting because I, I don't think I ever knew that the, that she also played as the blank. I guess I thought that that was a stunt person, but I'll have to rewatch. Budget the cuts. Consideration. They, had, right. they, they I mean, had to keep that budget well, under wraps. Yeah, they I already guess had, they're, they're already paying her $35,000. They were like, let's, right. get her, let's get her to do as much as possible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so uh, Madonna, this is a dual role. And yes, it's only $35,000 for the one. It's you're the same. You're the one <laughs> character. Well, that explains how she made $35,000 on 1990 scale rate. Cause if she was only getting paid to play breath, she wouldn't have made $35,000. She wasn't in the movie that much. Mm. Mm-hmm. I Look, I would take $35,000 to be in a movie. That, that, that'd be, I'd be like, hell yeah. I'll, I'll, mm. I'll play three characters. <laughs> I need 50 if I'm going to let Al Pacino slap me around. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Oscars. Well, he didn't have an Oscar yet then, so pooey. Okay, so let me ask a question about the movie. So do we assume that Breathless dies? I do. Oh. Do we live in a world where it's possible that, like, if, they're, if they were have, have going to have done a sequel to Dick Tracy, that maybe Tess did call the ambulance and <laughs> the ambulance arrived and maybe they revived Breathless and she's recovering in a hospital somewhere f- to show her face for Dick uh, Tracy, too. I mean, it's possible she was only passing out. The one person who clearly... Because there was no body is Big Boy. He just, mm-hmm. like, you don't even hear a splash or a crunch or a he splash. He bounces off the couple of gears, though. Mm, it wasn't sufficient. I needed him, like, torn asunder. But, <laughs> sorry, uh, hateful. I mean, I guess. Like, there was talk of a sequel, but Beatty's control of the rights is like a stranglehold on that. It's, yeah, I mean, movie, I, oh, look, I, I always assumed she just died, but you know, as she yeah, she well, kisses him, and then that's the last thing, and then she collapses. She gets her one moment yeah. of true emotion with him, and then pff, that's all she gets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Boy, that's, that's a morality tale, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That's the tragedy. Mm-hmm. Well, Very but moral then, majority, nineteen ninety, but whatever. Well, but then you can at least because you do have you know empathy for for Tess Trueheart so you think okay good at least now breathless being out of the way Tracy can finally stop being such a dick right <laughs> and you know be the true love 
that he is to Tess Trueheart, which um, with with Breathless in the way, I think that would never that would always be a thorn in Tracy's side. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, I think so- he's attracted to her too, right? I mean, that's the reason that there's so much, you know, tension. He was I tempted, think. of course. Yeah, yeah, but that wasn't Breathless's fault. That's his. Like, right. I mean, Breathless is just out here doing is. her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she, I think, knows that she has those sort of that that sort of control over over him um, because she must know that she's breathtaking and you know woo any man uh even the likes of dick tracy who absolutely should have some. even though she i don't know if he has any morals he just goes in there and like mows down a bunch of people in that one scene so like with there's a, a lot of violence in this movie <laughs> there, yes, right. there's I, so mean, much. Surpri- I mean not I there's not a lot of gore, but was. there is a lot of violence like a lot of a lot of people yeah. die in this movie people and die people that. slap each other around and punch each other and yeah mm-hmm. A lot of gunfire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, comic books have a lot of violence built into the, you know, things are resolved through violence for the most part. I mean, it plays into all these weird male archetypes. But, yeah, it was excessive in this movie. And I was like, is Warren Brady really like the, the like, macho archetype guns but I, then again it's 1990 it's still the height of the bush reagan bush era like mm-hmm. arnold and all of them are still like the top movie stars so i get it they had to play ball yeah, yeah I mean, it, was, it was good action i mean it, it, it moved over. i mean i thought overall the movie was entertaining and enjoyable you know there's some funny moments there's some poignant moments the you know the the soundtrack is great which obviously we will get to in another episode uh, about the music specifically madonna's music in this movie um but you know i it's enjoyable watch i think every now and again there's maybe one or two parts where i'm just like "Mm, okay but otherwise i i thought it was a win for madonna i was i was very happy she was in this movie i think it, the timing of the, its release was, uh, I think, the the thing that worked against it because, you know, Batman came out in 1989 and that movie was enormous and yeah. huge and popular. And when Dick Tracy came out the following summer, I think everyone was just comparing it to Batman. I think, you know, it came out yeah. and people were like expecting it to be just as good as Batman was. And it's a very different movie. It's a, you know, Dick Tracy's not a... Uh, a superhero like Batman, you know, he, he has a, a watch that, and, and his hands, you know, and a gun, you know, that's, it's, yeah. he's, he's just a detective. He's a cop. Oh, you know, man, it's, he's not, he's not a superhero vigilante like Batman and, you know, with a cape, you know. It's, right. But it's a great summer movie totally. and it has a lot of things to sort of look back on and go and, and wonder about, but also, look at through a different lens, you know, to sort of be nostalgic for what life at that time was like, what we were looking forward to watching films in the theater. Mm -hmm. Um, because definitely this is a, is a film that really at the time you had to watch it on the, on the big screen because it was so much action, so much going on. Well, um, and the colors were so rich. We also have to remember this movie came out, against two massive hits, Total Total Recall and Another 48 Hours. Uh, Oh, wow. So it it debuted in a very crowded release field against two mega hits. And so it's kind of like, well, was that the best place for it? Like, As a 13-year-old, I'm not going to see those other two films. Oh, I was totally at Total Recall. I mean, I was a little little older than you. But but I definitely, I was at Dick Tracy opening night. Yeah, oh, me I, too. I'm I saw sure. it opening weekend, but I saw Total Recall too because that movie was amazing. But <laughs> it is a good movie. It is yeah, a really good movie. but it's just interesting to like, you know, we think, oh, it wasn't as big a hit as Batman, but like it was up against a lot of stiff competition with movies that were very much of the moment and contemporary and kind of innovative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they. Yeah, but I it would have been interesting. Uh, oh, sorry. On. I was just going to say, I just remember Dick Tracy was everywhere. Like mm-hmm. once Batman came out and changed the game for how movies were marketed, like Dick Tracy was 
everywhere. Yes. Every store. The McDonald's commercials. Yeah, every store had Dick Tracy merchandise. I mean, you could not go anywhere without seeing Dick Tracy. I mean, mm-hmm. it was just it was as prevalent as the Batman symbol was the following the year before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I think that in some ways that probably they oversold it. Like I think so, too. You know, yeah. and that's that's a very Disney thing to do. Right. Like Warner wasn't expecting that Burton Batman movie to hit as big as it did. And then, of course, the amazing Prince soundtrack, mm-hmm. like, was fantastic. And so I think they were trying to duplicate it and didn't think about, oh, well, but let's still do our own thing. And that's a marketing thing, not so much the movie yeah. itself. Well, I so. also think the, 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 the huge difference between the two, and which probably held to its success, was Batman was a current movie. It was done in the time of when yes. it was being released. So even though and they didn't specify it was being done in 1989, it was living in the current time. Whereas Dick Tracy was a period film, you know, it was, it was, it was a current movie, but it was being done from the 1930s. And I just don't think young people resonated enough with it. It wasn't as cool because it was, these old, you know, these old cars and these, these, these weird guys in makeup and, mm-hmm. you know, like just the mobster mentality. And I just don't think that that was as cool as, you know, Batman was, you know, Batman yeah. was, it was the music just alone, having the Prince music with oh, Batman. That soundtrack was, is, oh. it was just, uh, it was uh, phenomenal. And I yeah. think that that's where, you know, th- the only soundtrack that had a modicum of success was Madonna's, you know, Mm -hmm. there were three soundtracks for Dick Tracy and one was the score. One was the song, uh, like the Sondheim esque music and and the Andy Paley songs. Yeah. And then there was Mm -hmm. Madonna's, but like, they're not going to, they don't have like a hit, like the Prince album did, you know, I mean, Vogue was the hit, but Vogue wasn't even in the movie, you know, it wasn't on the soundtrack. (laughs) Right. right, You know, it's like, so it was, it was weird. Like, I think that because of the time zone of the film itself, it, it, that sort of worked against it. Well, in retrospect, they missed an opportunity to try to be steampunky with it, where they could have had it set with retro style, but used futuristic technology, right? Like, they had the talking wristwatch things, which were almost like cell phone walkie-talkies. They should have just, like, leaned Leaned into that and had, like, just like Total Recall, they could have had video watches and, you know. Right, right, right. Almost like, almost retrofitting the 30s. So it's like a future 30s, whereas... Like Blade Runner. Yeah, where, like, instead they were living in the actual 30s, and I feel like that sort of... Maybe that were uh, who knows could have would have should have right yeah well I don't know now you've made me think that I was a weird teenager because I didn't think any of that no and I didn't I, either no no, no <laughs> I don't did. don't get me don't get me wrong <laughs> I I mean there was plenty of people who went and saw that movie it made a scat it made scads of money but ultimately you know like people don't sit there and be like I loved Dick Tracy. I mean, yeah. we as Madonna fans, maybe, but like, yeah. I don't know anyone else who's like, I love that movie. Yeah, I don't know anybody. It who doesn't today... have the cultural cachet, yeah. you know, like, right? No one I mean, today is like, you, oh my god, you will see it over and over, uh, Batman, over and over and over again on TV, and this, uh, Dick Tracy rarely gets shown. I mean, but a lot of that I feel has to do with the way Warren sits on those rights, and I mean, there are so many things that could have been done since then, and maybe it's like he doesn't want to taint or change what his view of the legacy of Dick Tracy, the film was, but did either of you watch any of the 30 year retrospectives that are on YouTube? So listeners, there's actually in 2020 at the height of the pandemic, because he probably was sitting around the house with nothing to do. There actually are several like sort of recorded zoom sort of 30th anniversary of Dick Tracy Mm. conversations that Warren Beatty actually participated in. In character, right? Some of them, and they're just not that interesting. Like, I I tried watching some of them last week, and I was like, Well, I had read the reason why he did that, like, in-character Dick Tracy one was because the rights were going to leave him yes, and he yes. had to do something or he lost them. And so he produced oh, like, yes. this 30 minute special of like Dick Tracy in character. And it's like Dick Tracy just sitting in a chair talking and 
that secured him the rights until he dies or something. It's it's like the Spider-Man rights with Sony and like that. They have to make a Spider-Man movie every like s- at least I think six to seven years or Marvel and Disney get all of it back. It's right. Yeah. So in order to retain that and who knows, maybe Warren Beatty just wanted to like not ruin the movie with the franchise. Maybe he wanted it to just be, or maybe he didn't want to play Dick Tracy over and over and over again. You know, he's, he maybe he's mm-hmm. just not that actor. So yeah, who, who knows why? But. I mean, did he even do, he did Bugsby a year later, and then I don't think he did another movie until Bullworth in '98. So, yeah, he hasn't done much since. I've honestly, that was this movie was the first time I had ever heard of him. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you really? Under the grass with Natalie Wood? Shampoo? No. Come on! Oh, no. he's, he's some good older movies. I didn't, I wasn't really like, he was guys, a hot I mean, in the day. Gonna have a, a <laughs> I rewatched Annie like 158 million times as a kid. Like I didn't watch, uh, I didn't, I wasn't the kid who was like, oh, I'm going to try this movie because I have never seen it. I was the kid who was like, let's watch Goonies. I already know how it ends, but I love it and I want to watch it again. Aww. So mm-hmm. I watched movies. You were watching that, Annie to get the choreography to Hard Knocks Life. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I loved it. Loved that film. Who didn't? Miss Hannigan? Come on. Mm-hmm. Oh Carol, Burnett that. As, Carol Burnett as a drunk Miss Hannigan is probably the most perfect thing from my childhood. I mean, I don't know why I worship that. Is that too funny. I did. That's another podcast. I, I right. Took, <laughs> yeah, right. No, I took care of my grandmother for several years in the 90s. So I spent a lot of time watching Turner Classic movies. And so, oh. and that's an education that sadly people don't get anymore because no one has cable or watches (laughs) classic cinema but yeah hbo max has a wonderful catalog with all of those movies on them go check out old warren Beatty when he was a hot piece (laughs) okay i'll do that i've got my homework (laughs) yeah i'll do that well everyone that is our show for today i want to say Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to all of our listeners for your support. It means so much. And don't forget, everyone, we will be back next month with our second movie of the Madonna Summer Movie Series. We will be covering A League of Their Own, a fun (sighs) baseball movie with All the Way May. And then, of course, closing out August with our summer movie series of Body of Evidence Get your candle wax and your rope and your, I don't know what, your, your deviant behavior ready, kids, because that's yeah. going to be a deep dive. I haven't watched that movie in a while. and uh, Get ready to behave like animals. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, everybody, you can find us on Instagram at MLVC Podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel at MLVC Podcast. You can also donate to the show. We're on Venmo, MLVC Podcast. Or think about becoming a subscriber. Get these episodes before anybody else. Patreon.podbean.com forward slash MLVC Podcast. Ben, Liberty, I know how you feel. You don't know if you want to hit me or kiss me. <laughs> well, if I was big boy, I'd want to hit you. <laughs> make you cry. And make all the little baby gays cry. It's that big boy thing where he's tying Tess Trueheart to the gear at the very end. And he's like, wait, I'm having a thought. I'm having a thought. <laughs> I'm, yes. I'm, it's, it's, it's gone. <laughs> he's so funny in that movie. Oh, my he's God. Hilarious. All right, kids. Enjoy your enjoy your black underwear. You too. <laughs> Don't let your bottom hurt just thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ow! Tracy, I'm the one in danger. Shouldn't be talking to a cop. You know what I want. I want to hear you say it. Well, I don't want you to be hurt. Don't tell me what you don't want. Tell me what you do want. You want me. You're right, I do mean you. In court, where you can tell the truth. You're lying. You want me the same way that I want you. You want me to take a risk? I want you to take a risk. I told you I'd protect you if you testify. Protect me? It's my job. I don't know about your job. I only know what I feel. If you can't tell me how you feel, Tracy, then I can't trust you. Wait a minute. What do you want me to admit? That I think about you? Okay, I admit it. Testify. You want my testimony? Tell me you want me. If you do that, I'll do anything you say. How bad do you want, big boy? It's up to you. Tell me you want me. Tell me you want it all. But tell me now. If 
I say that, I'm going to hurt somebody I don't want to hurt. I trust her. I love her.